And thank thanks to David and Esther for some wonderful talks. Um, I think what was really clear in, in their discussions is that, um, and in people's questions, is that environmental um, risk factors are, are becoming more prominent. Um, you know, I think they've changed significantly in the past um, 50 years that certain occupational risks um, and certain, you know, types of pollution, like traffic related pollution are maybe going away or changing because of regulations, but there are, are new risks we have to understand better and, and also start to address in our patients. Um, and I think uh, I work again in this, in the occupational and environmental medicine clinic um, as one of my hats. Um, and I think it's a really exciting place to work because you get to do a lot of multidisciplinary work with um, public health and um, with exposure scientists and, and try to advocate on that both individual basis and on, um, on larger basis for uh, ensuring or addressing these issues and, and trying to move beyond just, you know, what are the traditional risk factors we look at, like starting medications for cholesterol, um, what type of more lifestyle impacts um, and environmental risks can we uh, address? Um, and I know people had asked a little bit about kind of what can I do if I think um, people do have exposures either at work or in their in their home, how do I address them? Um, and I think knowing your tools is what's in your toolbox is, is hard to know and um, a really good starting point. Um, we do have uh, residents who rotate with us. So if anyone's interested in, you know, maybe spending a few days at the occupational medicine clinic and learning how to do an exposure history or um, do some of these, um, address some of these problems, we'd be very happy to have you and also uh, worker compensation as well. Um, and then also we're always available as a as a tool for, for questions, either kind of as an official consult or um, just emailing the, the providers to give you some, um, some help on how to um, navigate the system. I would say the worker compensation is a very bureaucratic system and can be a little, a lot of paperwork and, um, and difficult to, to know how to, how, to, um, how to help patients open claims. Um, but Washington State is, is actually very um, progressive and, and forward thinking, and I think usually lands on, on the sides of, of workers, but it often needs someone who's a, a, a able to advocate to help people, um, especially people who maybe English is not their first language or have other um, socioeconomic um, disparities that it can be a lot harder for them to get the care they need. Um, but if people, so kind of the types of um, patients I'll see in, in that clinic are, again, I specialize in kind of environmental and occupational lung diseases. So I um, see a lot of people with pulmonary problems, but also, um, you know, exposure related concerns that maybe they um, have, uh, have recently been diagnosed with cancer. And if they're wondering if uh, growing up, um, on a contaminated Air Force base may have played a role into their cancer. Um, so all those issues and, um, and trying to quantitate environmental exposures and, and what the increased risk might be, um, which as you've seen a little bit today, that is very difficult because people have a lot of chronic mixed exposures through their lifetime. So any, do people have any questions? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the, the talks today, first of all. Um, I, I'm a part of the, the primary care pathway in, in the IM residency, and as part of that, we get a very, you know, lucky, unique opportunity to go to state legislator, just go to state legislature and advocate for, like, health policy and, and such. And I was wondering if there's kind of any kind of unique, things to keep in mind as a as a physician when coming to like advocate for like state policy for changing different uh environmental impacts that disproportionately involve you know more vulnerable members of the community and kind of what to keep in mind when uh you're advocating for that yeah that's a great question and i'm sure i'm sure esther has some 
really good comments to add. You know, I think from a physician side um, that we are, um, that our opinion is oftentimes really valued um, and uh, taken into account. And I think if you can come with personal stories about um, patients you've seen in clinic um, or have um, a better sense of kind of what the risks are and how big those risks are and can um, try to communicate that clearly. It often, um, it, it can have an outsized effect, which is is really important. Um, and, and similar like that, you go to um, the Washington Labor and Industries has a similar meetings where they, this is how that wildfire um, rule came into effect. Um, similarly, the, they recently lowered the beryllium standard for people and also the silica standard in Washington state. And they really um, sought the, uh, the opinion of, of experts and of physicians so that I, you know, I was involved in all of those processes. So I think, again, you can be in a really unique um, position to, to make meaningful regulatory changes, especially if you have educated yourself about what the risks are. Thank you. Yeah, and I think the more the more you can connect, you know, the reasons why health matters for environmental justice, because I think a that framing and that wording also people feel disconnected. Like I had a we had a community conversation with folks and asked folks that talk about environmental justice every day in their practice. We asked them, what do you think of the term? And they're like, not comfortable using it, don't know what it means. And then we're like, well, what are some examples of you know injustices you've seen or what are you working towards as a solution? They can talk for hours about everything they do. And so like really breaking down some of the terms, which you know uh, physicians do very well because of how technical the terms can be, um, talking about the importance of the dis uh, disproportionate health harms on some communities or on some patients and why erring on the side of caution really matters for justice. I think the more people practice on it and can share that, I think will make a huge impact too. Thank you. I have a question for Esther. Um, I was curious about what your experience with community-based research slash community-engaged research has been. Like what have been some of your big takeaways? What are some things you've maybe were surprised about? Kind of entering, um, at having worked in that space for a while now, and then kind of what your advice might be for those of us who might be interested in engaging in this type of work. What are some like kind of things to keep in mind, um, kind of pitfalls to 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 avoid? And um, I'm overall really curious about what your experience has been like. Yeah, and on that topic, I could talk for like days on it. So feel free to follow up and we can talk more. I think essentially I'm really learning like how important the currency of trust is because easy to breach, right? Hard to build. And and really listening first, I think is so important for building that relationship. If you're starting from scratch, you might actually know people that do that. And so really going through that proxy trust is also, I think, a good successful route is if you know of somebody and they know of a group. And so really working through proxy measures of trust is a is a good avenue as you build your own. I think some of the pitfalls I've seen or, or potential things that kind of go like sideways and I get very nervous because I usually sit on the bridges of many of these partnerships is when a researcher would say, oh, you know, you're wrong. Like that experience can't be true because I know the data and I know the research or I know that health effect. And no, that doesn't sound like you're, the health effect you're experiencing is because of that contaminant. You know, listening first, because there might be other pathways or things that they might not be talking about. And so just, just even that basic, I think, human to human approach of listening, I think has been really key to fortifying trust or also, yeah, making things a little bit more brittle than usual. Um, and then really thinking about how, how are you shaping those research questions? Where is that question originating from? So, and I know sometimes, especially during your training, it's really hard to have control over that. But the more you can think about and push towards the starting with questions that are coming from the community, working with groups that have that connection. So I'm really lucky to be sitting actually in an organization that has trust with 70 plus other community organizations, and they all come together for these things. And so finding those kind of networks or hubs and tapping into that, I think can also be a successful route. And there's always things happening already. Um, oftentimes communities go, well, we we already said this to so-and-so because University of Washington is huge and there's so many individuals under it. And so really doing your homework, I think also helps too. But yeah, feel free to reach out because yeah, I can talk days about it.
All right, if that is all, I don't think anyone's ever complained about a meeting ending early. So um, we can we can wrap up there. Um, and I, it sounds like both Esther and Cora, it would be all right if people were to contact you if they had questions in the future about anything related to your work. Awesome. Perfect. Um, I'm really grateful to both of you for being here and everyone for paying attention and, and your thoughtful questions. Um, uh, as you can see, I think this is a really important topic um, and something we haven't really had much exposure to before. So hopefully we all got something from it. And with that, um, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day.